Thanks everyone for coming. My name is Robert Breeden, and I'm going to be talking about supervised classification, automation, and web facing distribution utilizing Python and Esri's Web App Builder. So, what is image classification? Image classification is the process of converting spectral signatures into groups of pixels or polygons and attaching the ecological classification as attributes to those features. So potential uses for image classification are conservation planning, landscape analysis, habitat modeling, and for my uses, we used it for vegetation inventory and land cover analysis. So basically, we're going to try and take this Landsat imagery and turn it into a classified raster that looks similar to this, or this imagery of Pima County and turn it into the land use classification. So presentation outline, I'm, first I'm going to give my problem statement, what are the goals of my study. I'll go over the study area and the data requirements, what's needed to run this tool set. Um, we'll look at some image processing techniques and supervised classification. Then we'll look at the results and the accuracy assessment. We'll compare this to a manual workflow, more traditional supervised classification workflow of digitizing training samples. We'll look at geoprocessing services, a little bit of server admin, and then web app builder and conclusions. So problem statement. The goal of this project is to create a Python tool to automate a common workflow of image analysis for preliminary assessment of land cover and vegetation communities through <coughs> supervised classifications. So the tool is primarily designed to assess the distribution of resources at multiple scales across various landscapes. So resources can be both natural and non-natural. Pima County. Pima County is one of 15 counties in Arizona, and it has over 9,000 square miles of land. And the class is, or, yeah, the class is symbolized in this map are similar to what we're going to see in our classified raster. So Tucson Mountain District, also known as Sorro National Park West, um, it's just west of the I-10, and it can be ac accessed by Picture Rocks Road and Kinney Road, which are also designated as scenic byways in the park. So data requirements. We can see the help window here to the right. Um, right here, we're going to get um, a summary of what the tool does. So it automates a supervised classification, makes a connection to your ArcGIS for server instance, and creates new web services of your results. So your input raster it has to be a raster data set, and it must be atmospherically corrected. Plot data. This has to be a point feature class attributing the vegetation types or the land use with a field called final type. So logical channels. Logical channels are an ancillary data used by the classifier. Um, they also have to be a raster data set, and it can be a DEM slope, rest, or slope or aspect. So a DEM would be useful if you have a lot of elevation change in your study area so that you can start to separate out those ecological zones by elevation. Um, for our purposes, we used an aspect raster because we noticed that different vegetation types occurred on north aspects and south aspects, and that allowed the classifier to have some referential information. So server URL, you need to provide your server URL and your username and password for authentication reasons to produce these web services. And then workspace path, you don't always want to overwrite your results, so defining a new folder every time you run the tool is, is useful rather than just, like I said, overwriting your results every time it runs. So image processing, soil adjusted vegetation index. This is basically an NDVI equation. NDVI assesses vegetative health, but this uses an L factor, which is a soil brightness correction factor, and it looks to reduce unwanted soil brightness in imagery. And so you can see from the code snippet that we used an L factor of 0.5. This is moderate. Your L factor can be from 0 to 1. This will work across basically any landscape. For less vegetative cover, you can use a higher L factor. Then we use principal components analysis. And this looks to transform an original data set into a substantially smaller, uncorrelated data set. So this is big. When you're working with raster imagery, you want, it, it's usually large data files. So being able to re reduce the size of those files will significantly, significantly cut down on your processing time. And so, Principal component analysis looks to capture the variance of your data set. And so the more variance that's captured, the more information content. So information content is measured as eigenvalues. And we can see that 
the accumulation of eigenvalues values in the first two principal components is 98%. Generally, you want to get at least 95% information content from your imagery, and then you can discard the rest of the principal components. So buffer analysis. This is where the tool is going to differ from your traditional supervised classification workflow. So generally, you'll come in here, and you'll start to digitize features around these point feature classes to give um, the classifier your training sites. Training sites are just areas in the map that are representative of a particular land cover. But the tool is going to make a buffer, as we can see, of 200 feet. That's pretty small, but you also have a lot of plot data points, so you are able to capture a lot of that variance inside of these training samples. So supervised classification, what is it? First, the user defines training sites, and then the software determines the spectral signatures of those pixels. From there, it starts to group those pixels to the class that it most likely matches based upon the spectral signatures em emitted. So here's our resulting raster. As we can see, we have nine semi-unique vegetation types. We have a lot of similar vegetation types. Um, a lot of the vegetation types are very small variants upon one dominant type. And so when we look at the accuracy assessment, we can see that our overall accuracy is close to, or very low at 32%. And we conduct accuracy assessments so that we can tell other people the usefulness of our classification. Um, the reason that this has such a, got such a low accuracy is because, like I said, the spectral signatures are just very similar between these classes. And so we would need to use a higher spectral resolution sensor if we wanted to increase the accuracy of this classification. And to compute that number, we're going to add up these cells in blue. That These are the correctly classified pixels, and the rest are incorrectly classified pixels. So looking at our land cover classification, we can, if you're from Tucson, you can probably start to recognize some of these features without even using the legend. So in dark blue, we have urban area. And then to the north, we have the Catalina Mountains. To the east, we have the Rincon Mountains. Down south, we also have mining. And up north, um, close to Marana, is higher agricultural density. And the rest of this open space is classified as desert scrub. So with this classification, we got 95% accuracy. Like I talked about before, this is because the materials that basically these classes are emitting spectral signatures that are far different from one another. And so we needed to evaluate the performance of the tool. Just because we got a low classification accuracy with the Swirl National Park West classification does not mean that the tool is not a valid workflow. So we did that by comparing this to a manual workflow, basically going in and creating tra training samples by digitizing um, and running all these geoprocessing tools by hand, one by one. And so we can see the tool performed marginally better than a manual workflow. And so really, that just validates the tool as an accurate way to um, classify imagery. So from here, this is where you're really going to take your ArcMap desktop-based project and turn it into more of a web-based GIS project. Um, so these methods are going to allow you to publish web services. Um, using this create GIS server connection is going to use that server URL, username, and password to create a connection to your server instance. And then it'll make this SD draft. And the SD draft is basically going to save specifications of your service. Then it'll upload the service to your server. And from there, it'll sit inside your REST services directory. Once it's in your REST services directory, you can start to consume these services as using the REST endpoint. So geoprocessing services. Geoprocessing services allow for the process to be completed in your application by the server rather than inside of ArcMap on your local machine. So working with geoprocessing services is far different than just running the script in, in ArcMap. So some of the things that I learned are you need to save all your executable methods to a result object. Because when the data gets copied to the server, it's going to get stored in a data store, and all those paths are going to change. And then your script's not going to be able to find any of the files that it needs to execute. Next, data types. For inputs and outputs, your data types need to be what you intend them to be. Otherwise, 
you're going to have it, it's not going to work correctly. And so if you want it to output as a geoprocessing service, you need to tell it so in the script properties. Also, you need to define an output file in your script and configure it in the supervised or in the script properties. So as you can see, this is a derived result and also the direction is set to output. And so this is where we start to consume these geoprocessing services in a web application. So I used Web App Builder because there's no coding involved and it allows you to rapidly produce applications. So first we can come up here and click this first geoprocessing toolbox. Um, it'll give you this dialog window. You can click execute. It's going to start processing. It'll probably take about a minute or so. And it'll give you the results and your legend. Same thing with the Pima County data. Click execute. This is probably going to take two, three minutes because there's a lot more pixels to be classified. And then you can use this base map gallery to put on high resolution imagery and use the slider to slide back and forth, see if you can start recognizing patterns in your classified raster with your underlying imagery. So to review, the tool automates an image processing workflow of a supervised classification with sufficient performance and then makes connection to your ArcGIS server instance, publishes the results as geoprocessing services, and then consumes these geoprocessing services in a GIS application. So how do we do it? We use Python and ArcPy. ArcPy gave us access to all the geoprocessing tools that we can find in ArcMap. Then we published, them at, published the results as geoprocessing services and configured the widget, widgets inside of Web App Builder. And so to conclude, class, classifications are iterative in nature. Therefore, automating, automating the workflow is efficient. Anytime that you have to do a workflow multiple times, using a script is generally going to allow you to be more efficient. Um, but this isn't a one-size-fit-all model, meaning that you have numerous different workflows to arrive at your classification raster, and there's numerous different ways to get high classification accuracies, so you really need to determine if this script is going to work for you. And so the accuracy assessment workflow is always generic, meaning that there's always a subset of tools that you can run to get those accuracy assessment tables. So this workflow will really work for anyone. Um, so all other project elements need to be in place to achieve a high classification accuracy. That's kind of what we saw with the Saguaro National Park West classification, where we had a really high resolution classification, and the vegetation classes were very small differences. The spectral signatures being emitted were minute changes upon one another. So we need a high resolution sensor to be able to match that. Um, Geoprocessing services are great. Because users without the Esri license or desktop GIS software can run this script, they can do the processing, and they can visualize their results in the application. And usually the processing is quicker by the server, at least in my experience, than running on your local machine. But they're hard to configure. Uh, if you don't work with them very often, then they are going to be tricky. And users may not want to wait for the processing to complete. Because when you run it, you, it'll take one to three minutes. Usually you want your web application to be pretty responsive. And finally, we saw that the tool is a valid workflow. And we compared that to a manual traditional supervised classification workflow where you would digitize the training sites. And I'm going to leave it there. If Does anyone have any questions? <laughs>